Kia ora kato, no mai hari mai. Uh, so welcome to you all and welcome to this month's EHF live session. Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a collective of entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives, investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa in New Zealand. Now this session is part of a series where you'll hear from Scott Kabat, an EHF fellow who is an experienced operating executive and entrepreneur with a track record of building customer-friendly mainstream brands to compete in historically unfriendly categories. His experience includes subscription businesses, marketplaces, healthcare, internet of things and consumer packaged goods. So in this session, we're going to be focusing on building a marketing team where Scott shares his insights on the when, who, how and where things can go wrong. And last month, we were looking at brand positioning where Scott shared his insights on why it matters, how to approach it, and best practices. And you can see all of his sessions um, in the recordings on our website. And there's going to be plenty of time for Q&A with Scott during the 60-minute session. So note these are informal sessions. They are planned in a way that you leave here after 60 minutes, that you know the fellows and on a sort of personal level so that you can understand what their intentions are here and you can connect with them directly. Now, stay all muted unless you're going to ask a question. You can either put the questions in the Q&A, but as we're a nice small team, you can actually raise your hands and ask those questions. Over to you, Scott. Thanks, Michelle. By the way, it's Cabot, but it's commonly mispronounced, so it's quite, uh, quite all right. Nice to meet everyone. I'm glad we have a small group. It'll, it'll make for good discussion. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, let, me, hold on, let me share my screen real quick. Of course, I lost that. Where the heck are you? Try that one more time. There we go. Everybody able to see that? Great. So, hey, look, uh, I, I have uh, a few pages here. With, I was telling Michelle before we start that uh, these uh, questions about building a marketing team and startup or startups are, th there's never one right answer. You'll probably come out of today with more questions than answers. Um, so my, my goal is not to tell you the one definitive right way to do it, it's more just to, um, to empathize with the fact that it's difficult and also to give some uh, general principles and guidelines to think about as you navigate this process. So I have a few uh, pages to share based on my past experience as a CMO and now as a consultant and advisor to many early stage companies. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, we've got a lot of time for Q&A. Feel free to interrupt me along the way if you have questions. Uh, as Michelle said, just raise your hand or throw it in the chat. And then uh, we, we should also have plenty of time at the end. Okay, so um, just quick flow of this. I'll do a, just a very brief introduction and and to um, you know into my background. We'll talk about the challenges of building a marketing org, uh, and then I'll break down a little bit of you know why is it important? When should you do it? How do you think about going about it? Um, so just very quickly on my background, I think we, this is the third of these workshops, but I think most of the folks we have today are, are first timers, which is wonderful. Um, you know, early in my career, I was management consultant and uh, cut my teeth in consumer packaged goods where I learned the fundamentals of marketing. Um, a lot of time in uh, consumer tech with some B2B to C also across a range of categories. Um, always this kind of this dual focus of likable brand and unlikable category, uh, as well as uh, very focused on building scalable revenue engines. Um, I have... Uh, I've worked in various stages from co-founding companies to coming into startups when they're going into growth mode to uh, working at very large companies like Cisco. So I, I've seen this uh, um, these marketing org questions manifest themselves at various different stages of growth. Um, and then, yeah, finally today, so I, I live in uh, the US in the Bay Area. Um, Founded uh, 621 five years ago, which is a, a marketing consultancy where a community of fractional marketers who we plug into startups and private equity backed businesses, <clears throat> whether they're fractional CMOs or boots on the ground help and demand gen brand content, et cetera, to help companies build the pieces 
to uh, to scale their go to market engines. So um, just setting the stage for diving into these questions about the the uh, when when and how to build a marketing org, I wanted to go from the fifty thousand foot level down to ten thousand. Um, and so I just wanted to hit, first of all, highlight, like, wh what are some of the big challenges in getting marketing right? Because you see a lot of companies struggle with it. Um, early on, one of the, the common issues is around focusing too narrowly on the go-to-market engine. Actually, like going narrow cast for picking a market segment. But what often uh, happens with early stage companies, and we talked about this in one of the prior sessions, is you get kind of addicted to the drug of paid marketing on Facebook, Google alone. And, and those are wonderful, efficient channels. I like them a lot for converting the mid funnel. I like them as environments for testing messaging and audience. They aren't great for building organic momentum and you will hit a point of diminishing returns on them. So it's really important to look beyond those alone, and also to think about retention and loyalty and long-term value of your customer base. Um, so that's one. Another is, oh, whoops, I went too fast. Brand confusion, uh, you know, super important to make sure you're really clear on target market. How do we consistently uh, message and position ourselves to that crowd? How do we make sure our customers understand what we're about and why we're here? Um, so consistency becomes really important there. And, you know, the risk in trying to go too broad here is you end up trying to be all things to all people, um, which, you know, even for startups that aspire for world domination, as most do, um, you have to start narrow early on. So I, I think that um, developing the discipline about re being really tight on who we are, why we're here and what we want our brand to be is really important. And then finally is this question of the team. And uh, look, you see this a lot where CMOs are cycling in and out of marketing roles. Um, you know, you see a lot of misfires in marketing hiring um, or, you know, a lot of consternation like, hey, we're, we're, we're paying for this marketing team. They're a cost center. Is that really working? Um, and so there's a lot underneath that, right? Sometimes you just got the wrong team for this stage of growth or there's this mix between digital and analog doesn't work, or we've got people who are too senior, too junior. Um, and finally, you know, and we'll talk more about this, it's super important to build a marketing org that's agile, just like in uh, best practices and product management, thinking about that in marketing and how you um, design both your talent and your supporting technology stack to enable experimentation iteration becomes really important. So these are common issues we see across a wide range of startups. Um, so talking about the, the org question specifically, look, it's super challenging, right? Uh, one thing that's happened in marketing uh, in kind of on, on hyperdrive over the last decade is that marketers are specializing more and more. Um, you could put out a job profile for a marketing role and have a thousand candidates and they literally could have a thousand different specialties, right? So understanding how to navigate that. And this is something we see very common in, in early stage startups, particularly with founders who are very product and engineering driven, um, that you know, not having that, that uh, Rosetta Stone for how to translate all these different marketing specialties becomes really challenging. Um, now, in other cases, like you can get it right and the business changes and six months later, it's like, hey, we've got this marketing team, but we don't have the right team for the next stage of growth. Um, and the last one is kind of an amalgamation of a few ideas, which is um, particularly for startups, you, it, it's not at all uncommon to look at marketing as a cost center. Like, hey, these heads and, and their budget are cutting into our profitability. Um, marketing's ambiguous by nature. There's rarely one right answer. So, you know, combine those two, it cre can create a really complex situation that's tough to navigate. So I've talked about why it's a big problem. Let's talk, let's talk about why it's important. Um, first of all, I, I think that, uh, it, and this is, I, I want to talk, just to contextualize this, this isn't so much why marketing at all. I want to 
think about it in the context of marketing in the early stages of a startup and, and how you ought to be thinking about starting to build that muscle. Um, first is look, it, it, one thing we see a lot um, with a lot of tech startups is it's very tempting to have kind of a, a product out mentality. Here's what we're able to build. Now let's go sell it. And I, you know, I, I feel pretty strongly that that's a, a risky and not very successful way to build a business. Um, one of the benefits to building some marketing muscles early on are that it, it sort of forces a customer centricity around defining who the core customer is and how every element of the, the product or service experience, whether it's B2B, B2C, um, you know, whatever categories and how, and then across functions from marketing to sales to customer success, product, whatever, how all that is feeding the needs of this particular customer segment. So building that kind of muscle early on yields benefits outside of marketing alone over time. Secondly, you know, we, we just touched on this. It's incredibly important to start to test and iterate on who the right audience is, what's the right message, what's the right way to convert them, what's the right way to move them through our funnel, and building some cadence and some good process hygiene, not just in product development, but also around experimentation and marketing. The sooner you start to do that, the sooner you'll be able to course correct validate assumptions that are wrong and get data that you can then bring to bear to make your team smarter. And then finally, you know, look, everybody's after this idea of hockey stick growth. And I, I think that the importance of um, starting to seed the machinery for your organic flywheel can't be understated, right? And this is back to the point, there's only so far you can go and buying your way to growth through Google AdWords, for instance. Um, it takes time to build a brand. It takes time to build advocacy and word of mouth. And so the earlier you start to uh, put the machinery in place to unlock that virality, the more, the sooner you'll get to the point where you start to unlock that hockey stick of virality. Then there's question of when, you know, I have this analogy I use a lot around where how marketing evolves through the life stage of of startups, you know, early on, and, and this is, I don't think specific to marketing at all early, it's very common to have a team of Swiss army knives. Like these are people who are utility players who can do a little bit of everything, right? They can run Google ads, they can come in and, you know, if you need them to put product samples in envelopes and get them out the door, they can do that. If you need them to you know, help find office furniture for the new hires. Like these are people who can do a little bit of everything and are really critically important because they're also the keepers of the culture early in the startup. You, you don't need me to tell you that. I would say when it comes to marketing specifically, you're looking here less for uh, people who are deep functional experts in any one discipline of marketing, but that they can more that they can speak the language across different marketing needs, whether it's the quant side of you know, running some online ads or writing a press release or working with the product team and a launch plan for a release. They can do a little bit of everything. Then over time, as you start to grow, you transition from the Swiss Army knives into scalpels, right? Like, okay, we need someone who's awesome at email who can do that all day long. We need someone else who's a pro at corporate communications who can do that all day long. And you, know, you go deeper into these areas of functional expertise. Um, oftentimes what I see that I think is an underrated challenge in that is that as organizations get into a team of scalpels, there's a risk of losing the connective tissue. And to get to scale, I think that's incredibly important. You need to have a balance of functional depth and expertise, but with some breadth also with some generalists in the team whose job is to coordinate um, what all the specialists are doing into integrated marketing campaigns and unified messaging, et cetera. Let me pause on that for a minute. Any questions so far? Does analogies make sense? Good, keep going. All right, silence is approval. Um, 
And let's talk about the how. Here, I, I want to just get into the details of some basic principles, um, and then we'll um, we'll bring this around and, and wrap up. I only have a few more pages. Um, first of all, I, I think it's it's you know not surprising as in most functions you can start lean. I, I don't think early on, you know, early stage startups need to take on a huge bloated marketing team. Um, you'll see. I'll share some uh, sample org charts in a minute, and you'll see one of the one of the interesting points is I like I, I find sometimes startups um, get a product into market, they get some initial traction, and they raise an equity round, and then the mandate is like, okay, let's start marketing, let's go find a CMO. And usually, my message at that point is, you don't need a CMO yet, right? You really want a mix of doers and player coaches. So I think there are ways to do this that enable, and we'll we'll get deeper into this in a minute, that enable you to to build the machinery while also staying true to the idea of building a lean org. So generally, I think it's important that you need at least one person who's a generalist who can keep the trains running on time and, and mesh the machinery together and play that Swiss army knife role. I think you need one or more people who are going to instrument the basics around the digital funnel to make sure that you're capitalizing on whatever interest you're creating and also you know, building out, as I mentioned, that process hygiene around experimentation iteration. Uh, there are uh, wise ways to leverage contractors and agencies and you know, full disclosure, that's a little bit of what I do right now, not as an agency, but with a team of fractional operators, but there are some watch outs and I lived this as a CMO myself. Um, I think it's really important to be, force yourself to be as precise as possible on what's a must and what's a want, especially with hiring agencies. A lot of agencies will offer that, you know, we can do this and this and this and this. Yes, we can be a one-stop shop for everything. More often than not, they have one or two sweet spots that they're really great at, and they're not so good at the other stuff. And so I would just be really sure that the if you're bringing in an agency that they're the best for the number one must that you have that you absolutely have to get right. Um, I'm a, personally, I'll reveal, you know, my bias is this is exactly what we do at 621. Is I'm just a big believer in the embedded model of, you know, whether it's a contractor, an agency, or whomever, you want them to operate as an adjunct member of your team as opposed to just a service provider. Um, you know, it is it's early stages of the startup, like buy-in and engagement to what the company is trying to do are, are incredibly important. And it will amaze you even with um, direct marketing, you know, companies that all run your, could run your Facebook or Google ads for you, how much artistry can go into their attribution and their, their tracking. So you really want to make sure that these people are, are working as a part of your team and invested. All right, wait, I just saw something pop up in the chat. Let me see. Um, Steven asked a question. How do you evolve from early into next stage into the next stage where you're a bit bigger, maybe 30 employees, or further on once you've been around for a decade? What can a stable, like a seven-year-old company, learn from these principles? Oh, you have to leave a little early. Got it. Okay. Steven, thank you for the question. So let me see if I can pick that apart. Um, yeah, so the first part about evolving to when you're 30 employees in a way that's scalable, and then what can st yeah, stable companies learn from these principles? Okay, let me try to, let's tackle feel free to Feel free to weave it into whatever you're doing. I just, I, I, I have to go to another meeting at 1030 and I wanted to make sure I got a question that's in, that's okay. so I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> no, 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 that's quite all right. Let's do this. Let me get through this page because I think I'll address some of those things at least tangentially. And then before we talk about the org charts, we'll go back to your question. Um, thank you. Those are great questions. Um, yeah, so then, I mean, this I think I could spend half an hour on, which I won't, but there are a lot of watch outs in working with contractors and agencies. I will say, for instance, here's something I, I lived myself as a CMO, and I see a lot from companies we work with in working with PR agencies, which are like, wow, they pitched us. I loved what the senior people, the managing partners say. They sounded so passionate about our business. I believed everything that they, they got it. And then as soon as we signed a contract, I had a, someone who was fresh out of university as my day-to-day -day person. And they don't seem to know any more about this than I do. Um, 
And so, I, look, I, that, that's one of many. I think it's it's super important just to to vet these. Um, companies and, and also to make sure that they're really hungry for your business because the reality is in the early stage of a company when you don't have a big budget you're not going to be a big profit center so to these to these outside parties so they've got to really believe that um, investing their time and, and sweat equity in you is going to enable their business to take off as you grow so anyway, I'm happy to answer more more questions on that. Um, I think, and and Stephen, this is one that I would argue uh, is a often a breakdown with companies at any size or stage, whether it's an early stage startup or a you know more mature business that's been around. Is it always amazes me? Like, go into large marketing organizations and let's say, well, we need more insights. We got to do more research, more research, more research, and more often than not, when you get under the hood, you find out that, that the, there's a lot of insight in the building already that isn't being socialized and digested, right? Um, and so, and I see it. I see it within marketing teams, and I see it between marketing and product, marketing and sales, et cetera, et cetera. Where you know, if the marketing team is on the front line getting customer feedback on the product, on the messaging and positioning, et cetera, et cetera. You need to make sure that what they're learning is being disseminated into the company and affecting not just the marketing, but also the product roadmap. Because um, I, I do find that, uh, look, the best orgs have people throughout the organization who are, well, even if it's just with friends and family, they're having touch points with potential customers. And if they're not disseminating that back into the company, that's a lot of lost knowledge. Uh, I do think that consistency is incredibly important as you build the team uh, and as well as cross-functional, like that I, I mentioned this idea of losing the connective tissue. Um, I do see a lot of times in marketing orgs, like the email person is running with their plan and the paid media person has theirs and the content person has theirs. But then from the customer perspective, they're receiving all this and it's almost like they're receiving it from people working in three different companies, right? And so clarity and alignment and consistency are important. The other thing is whether it's a B2B or B2C business, your, your customers get fatigued if you're hitting them all the time um, with competing messages. So make sure you do it you know, strategically and selectively. I'm a big believer that less is more in that. Um, Michelle and I were talking before, before we started just about the importance of fit. I'd say, especially in an early stage company, like there's the skill set, but then there's the level of like, Hey, does, is this person going to fit in our culture? And especially in marketing, because if they're going to be the face of your brand, then damn it, you want to make sure that like, they're a good representation of the culture. Um, finally, uh, I think it's incredibly important in all this to just be savvy to the fact that all of this will change. And so like Stephen, you asked about like, whether it's 30 employees or a 70 year old company, where I see a lot of them get tripped up is they're fighting the last war, right? Like the needs of the business have changed or they've outgrown some of the talent or they've got people doing you know, marketing jobs that made sense a year ago, but don't make sense now. And so it doesn't mean that you always have to purge the team and start over. But I think at least from my, my own subjective experience in marketing, maybe more so than some other functions, you have to constantly be thinking about, do we have this talented person in the right role for their skill set, And how do we adapt that? Um, so look, I, I'd say, and, and Stephen, going back to your questions, I, the, the last thing I'd say is that I don't think these themes are unique to startups. And I don't think they're, um, I, frankly, and I've seen this at various stages as an operator myself, I think the threads are very common regardless of the stage of growth. Um, so I tried to, I kind of chipped away at your question a few different ways. Did I hit the high notes? Is there anything else you'd like to ask on that before you have to jump? Yeah, no, that that's really helpful. And I guess just as a comment, um, what I see is that after companies have been going for a while, they kind of forget the urgency of being fresh with their messaging and their marketing. 
because they start yes. to believe their own hype and their own marketing story, if you like. Yes. And it becomes all about the company or, you know, of course you should come to us because we're the best. And instead, what you need to maybe be thinking, this is my own reflection, so you can correct me, but you should yeah, always be thinking about how can we serve our customers? How can we be, you know, we're, we're, it's not about us, it's about them. And sometimes it feels like, organizations have been around for a couple of decades it's all about you know our story rather than it's about your story so yeah I, I, lo I, I love that I agree wholeheartedly with that and you do see I think and it's very tempting particularly in, in companies with with a lot of you know with a sophisticated product that it's very tempting for your marketing just to become very self-referential right like here's what it is it's great you should love it but at the end of the day, whether it's B2B or B2C, you got to make sure that the person on the other end of it, that it's it's addressing a problem that a, the person on the other end of it faces. So yes, I love that point. And back when I showed that that image of the arrows going into the customer, that was exactly, like you, you, you said it much more elegantly than I did. So thank you. Um, and then oh, finally, I just had two more things to share. And, and look, this is all with the giant caveat that this is not to, meant to be the definitive way to do it. But I wanted just as a, as a teaser to share, this is something we use with some of our private equity partners um, we work with around helping them think about the early incarnations of a digitally savvy, savvy marketing world. So there's one for B2B and one for B2C. And actually what we've done here is to say, look, What's in blue are your highest priority hires. Gray probably comes next. And then the one with dots, you, you'll, if you keep growing, you'll probably hire eventually, but they might be places to start with contract resources, right? And so what you see here in B2B is making sure that early on, you're building two muscles, that kind of generalist corporate marketing muscle, um, and the the digital the the efficient demand gen and digital ops one and so those become the places to start now you'll note both here and on the next page as I mentioned earlier you don't see the CMO or VP of marketing as the very first hire you know I think there's a lot you can do here by starting with the lieutenant level um, building out you know these are people who are player coaches who can be strategic, but can also roll up their sleeves and get things done. Though, what you want to avoid is over hiring at this point, where you get someone who's super senior but isn't comfortable rolling up their sleeves and and doing, right? Um, so I'll, I'll hit the B to C one, and then you guys may have some questions on these uh, on these org charts. And the B to C it looks fairly fairly similar. Um, You'll notice a couple differences here on this. This on the left, rather than corporate marketing, I combined brand and product marketing into one. Which over time, you it's not it's not uncommon to have them segmented, but it's very similar to the corporate marketing function on the B two B side. Um, a separate head around acquisition and growth, and then I do think e an email, someone who's actually executing and managing email and drip campaigns uh, and all that becomes really important. Now, what, what I put here that um, you may not do at the beginning, but I am a big believer from my own CMO experience that over time, this is a smart way to go, that I, I am a believer in splitting life cycle from acquisition. Um, it's very common in marketing orgs to roll um, retention under a broad growth team that's very acquisition focused. Um, and the risk in that is, Honestly, the the retention priorities usually are always like the stepchild that doesn't get enough attention. Um, and in, in building good unit economics, I think having you know one team that focuses on life cycle and one that focuses on acquisition helps you more and when a more disciplined, deeper way address CAC on one end and LTV on the other. Um, let me pause there. There's a lot on those two pages. Are there other questions? I'll go back to the B2B one for a sec if anyone has questions on that.
And see, content potentially you can do through a contract early on too. You know, just what we're trying to get at here is a little bit of the sequencing you go through of like, there's probably a first wave of hires, then a second wave, and then a third. And I think that's all I've got. Um, thank you for uh, thank you for bearing with me. I know that's a lot of information to throw at you. Are there other questions or observations? Which of those um, <clears throat> would be okay to actually have like quite disjointed from if your current team's in New Zealand? Which ones would be okay sort of culturally to fit maybe up in the US or wherever a country is um, <coughs> exporting to? Yeah, it's a good question, Michelle. I, um, I mean, I think I won't answer it as specific to New Zealand. I, you know, what I, but what I would say in general, as it, and I didn't get into this as much here because we're, you know, I was thinking more through the lens of early stage. But um, it is important as the, you know, as the organization grows and as a, a business is doing meaningful business across markets that there's that kind of the balance of centralization versus local customization right like i was talking to a business yes a SaaS business yesterday that's based in australia that's very much into product-led growth and they're having a hard time getting that model to translate into the u.s right and so i think that it's not to say that you have to have boots on the ground in every single market that you're in but i think it's incredibly important to be sensitive to the cultures of the markets you're doing business in and understanding how the go-to-market model um, needs to vary. Um, when it comes to PR and communications, you very often do need local resources who, who know the press and know the communication channels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, yeah, and then, you know, look, I, I, I will say the, the degree of digital savvy and focus and the focus on... Um, you know, acquisition marketing versus brand marketing can vary by market, but ultimately I'm, I'm of the mind that, you know, as, as a startup grows, they're going to need to balance those regardless. Nice. Okay. Thank Madeline, you. do you have a question? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I had muted you, Madeline. Sorry, because there's a lot of background noise yeah, there. Cool. Just sorry about that. I preemptively unmuted myself. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, thanks, Scott. That was, that was amazing. Thank you for that. Um, my question is possibly twofold, but they might be pretty <clears throat> Connected. So you, you talked yeah. um, early on about sort of building this machinery for organic um, sort of growth, I guess, and, and kind of that, that flywheel. Are there yeah. any specific roles that you think are really critical to that early stage in the context of B2C? And the secondary part of that question was um, how important do you think those content roles are, I guess, for a B2C organization? I see you have them as a sort of a second priority, but are they quite important in terms of that kind of flywheel for growth? Thank you, Matt. I appreciate the question. So let, let me make sure I heard. So the, the first one is about um, building the organic flywheel in B2C, and the second is about the role of content in B2C. Um, Did I get that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I'm wondering Great. if those are connected. Yes. Um, well, so on the organic flywheel, you, you hit on uh, one of the things we touched on in our last workshop, which is one of my like things I hold very near and dear as a, as a B2C person by background, is that... Um, I think there is an, a big opportunity to have your early customers really be the face and mouthpiece of your brand, right? And, um, you know, to me, organic, the unlock on organic happens much more naturally when it's um, kind of in a very authentic way versus a transactional way like when transaction is like there's only so far you're going to get and saying hey we'll pay you to make a bunch of recommendations for something that you like but don't love right i'd rather see that you have a small group of people who just love and live and breathe by your product and really want to talk about it um and so you know whether it's putting them on your website or building test, uh, testimonials case studies um you know, any opportunity for them to kind of like, I, I, I have a very mission driven D to C business. I was worked with a lot over the last couple of years. They do like all their Facebook ads are basically just showcasing stories from their existing customers. So to me, that's the right DNA to start, start to build your organic flywheel. Um, 
I think what you have to get comfortable with, and, and again, we could spend hours on this topic alone, is uh, you have to be comfortable with the idea of, of starting a lot of little fires and a lot of them are just gonna flame out, right? Um, and you know, it's not so much like, and so you need to find a way to do it that is fairly turnkey and you know, limited amount of customization so that you can do them in volume, right? Um, so anyway, and we can we can certainly chat more about that on uh, on content. And uh, I'm a I'm a huge believer in the power of content. And this is this actually both your questions are connected in a way because I do think that content can help really build organic momentum. I think the the mistake I see. Um, a lot of companies, especially early stage companies make with their content strategy is well, twofold. One is like, I see this a lot in my business. We'll meet companies and say, hey, we just need content. And I'll say, whoa, 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 slow down a second. Like, what's the strategy behind the content? And then let's populate a calendar that, that maps to that strategy. So I, I do think that stepping back for a minute is, is helpful. The other thing is, it's really tempting, and I see this a lot, to make your content all promotional or almost advertising in nature. Like it's all content talking about how great our, uh, we are and how great our product offering is. And look, I, I do think that's an important part of a kind of content strategy, but it's one part of the equation. I think what's equally or maybe even more important is thought leadership content where you're finding conversations in the culture that are already happening and plugging into those and providing a unique point of view on them. You have to be comfortable in that situation with the idea that um, you know, you're not shamelessly plugging your product as much, but you're building a voice for your brand as having an interesting point of view on a conversation that's happening already. Um, does that make sense? Like, um, you know, like uh, there are a lot of productivity softwares or hacks out you know today and it would be equivalent to be like rather than just talking about our product and all the features it's like hey work from home's a big trend like here's some things we're seeing and how work from home is going and how that's influencing productivity um writ large in the culture and what i like about that is that that thought leadership content is honestly much more likely to get shared because nobody likes feeling like they're being advertised to and if it's it, it's much more likely that they'll say, hey, that was interesting. That this, These guys made me think. And, th and it becomes a long tail into their learning about your brand. Did that answer your question? Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And uh, I might reach out and expect you more questions on that. Yeah, yeah. No. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, we uh, we covered a lot of territory, Michelle, in a short period of time today. We had a yeah, smaller no, audience. Good. Yeah, so yeah. unless, uh, Madeline, you've got any others, or Julian, if you wanted to bring anything up at all. Um, yeah, have you two got each other's email address? Scott, did you want to put your consulting? Sure. Sure, I'll put that in the chat right in now. Case someone wants to yeah, I'm, I'm always happy to answer more questions on this. Um, there we go. And then also the recording that Scott was referring to for the last session is there on that website. And then I've put, and that's also the same one that you can um, register for brain positioning is the next session that's coming up as well. What, what was Madeline, what is, speak, what is Speak Sense? Yeah, oh, if sorry. you go into that link, it, it's, yeah, so we had, um, We've done building um, the marketing team was today, uh, customer acquisition, building your MVP marketing engine, and then the um, I know customer acquisition is the one to come on the 19th. We've had building your MVP oh, right. marketing engine and brand positioning. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll go and check those out. Um, and yes, yeah, Scott, to answer your, your question. So speak sense, we're really early stage and we're based in Wellington and New Zealand. Um, and we are an AI-powered direct consumer platform for fragrance. So we help people find fragrances that suit them using machine learning. Um, and oh, cool. And subscription service we offer off the back of that. Oh, I started my career in uh, packaged goods, and so we dealt with uh, fragrance uh, manufacturers a lot. I can't say I'm an expert on oh, wow. it, but it's a fascinating space. And, and I also know I have a terrible <laughs> nose. I'm not any good at judging fragrance. Um, that's very cool. Uh, well, and I love it's uh, it's fun to hear the uh, the B2C related questions. 
Um, good. Well, if uh, uh, Julian, thank you for your, uh, your, I see your chat, not a problem at all. And if either of you have uh, you know, further questions, let me know. I'm always happy to talk further on these topics.